Hello everyone and welcome to today's Visage webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some items to help you participate in today's webinar. If you're experiencing technical difficulties joining the webinar session, please dial support at 888-259-8414. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in the control panel. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. You are invited to submit a question through the questions pane in the control panel. A recording of this presentation will be sent to attendees via email in 24 hours. I would now like to introduce the moderator for today's webinar, Joe Galvin, Chief Research Officer at Vistage Worldwide. Joe, you may now begin. Welcome everyone. I'm Joe Galvin, your host for today's webinar. This is the latest webinar in our Leading Through Challenging Times series. This series is designed to cut through the noise and provide the definitive source of thought leadership on the topics that matter most to small and mid-sized businesses, uh, to our small and mid-sized businesses. Today, we're talking about accounting and financial strategies. When we look at business optimization, there's four categories. There's talent management, customer engagement, operations, and financial strategies. Our presenter today is Matt Garrett, a Vistage speaker and the founder and CEO of TGG Accounting. We spoke to Matt back in, in late March uh, when we were still in this free fall from uh, down to where we are in, in the in the corona crisis and he had some great insights and we thought it'd be great to bring him back uh, at a time when things are a little more we're kind of at a level where we are uh, to see what what he has learned and how he can help us on these accounting and financial strategies to help us thrive and survive in this in this in this market for over 20 years matt has focused his career on the development of small business personal finance and advanced tax and compensation issues he's a serial entrepreneur has founded and sold a number of businesses Calling on his own experience as a business owner and his desire to reduce, to reduce business failure, he founded TGG Accounting in 2006 to help SMBs with the vital financial infrastructure they need to succeed. Matt, there's a lot of pressure on our, our members out there uh, to make sure they get these financial decisions right. We're glad to have you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate everything that Vistage is doing to, uh, to support the, the small business community in this time. Uh, and again, thank you uh, for having me. Very appreciative of the opportunity today. Uh, I want to quickly kind of share with you what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the current situation, talk a little bit about uh, the government programs that are out there. And then I'm going to give you some uh, tactics, some real to do's uh, and things that you can do. And actually going to show you some tools that we've developed as well that you can use uh, to really thrive and, and, and survive, not just survive, but actually go out and be proactive and do some really exciting things uh, coming up. Again, I'm founder and CEO of TGG. We're an outsourced accounting firm. Uh, we build accounting departments that save people 40 to 60% uh, compared to uh, hiring full-time employees. And our mission is really to make business owners' lives better through excellent financial management. So that's what I'm gonna aim to do today. So um, again, today it's really about survival strategies and, and, and the ability to thrive in this post-coronavirus uh, Economy that we've got now. So what can you do really to take advantage of the situation and improve your business? First of all, what on earth is going on? I mean, this feels so strange. I know I'm sort of concerned. We've got general economic conditions that, that really make me feel like we're, you know, we're all screwed. What, what's going to go on here? Nothing's going to be the same uh, after this crisis is over. But the optimist in me says, I'm going to survive. I know you guys are going to survive because someone in every industry is going to survive through this. And it's a matter of what do we need to do to make sure that that happens when we've got situations like 20 to 40 percent unemployment coming, depending on how long this lasts. We've got corporate profits that are down anywhere from 50 to 90 percent, where we're looking at global shutdown, where you know, for example, five billion people basically are not living their normal lives right now. Um, it really looks like we're headed into a, a, a depression, at least a recession, probably a depression, and it's a longer-term scenario. We're talking two to five years because it really historically looks a lot like um, the 1930s, from 1930 to 1940, where there was a high government debt starting off uh, when they came into the economic crisis. And then there was a lot of stimulus money uh, being put in there. And again, not necessarily cost inflation, but definitely monetary inflation. So the question is, is, is really, what does the new normal look like? And are you going to be one of those survivors that comes out of this? And how are you going to make that work? In my opinion, numbers uh, at times like these are absolutely mandatory. And data is the key to survival. Our guts as entrepreneurs typically get us through a lot of tough situations, but when we get in scenarios like this, it's really important for me at least to feel safe 
because when I'm looking at objective data that I know is right, it helps me feel that, that peace of mind that I know I'm making a good decision. So that's really kind of uh, what we're doing. So let's talk about how to survive. First of all, you got to build a crisis team. Disaster planning forecast, you scenario plan through this thing, make sure you've got your collections in order, make sure your supply chain's in order, legal strategy, and then hoard cash, uh, and ultimately do some cost cutting. So what does a crisis team look like? The crisis team looks like your business bankruptcy attorney, your CFO, uh, a banker, a CPA, a personal financial planner, so that you can make sure your personal finances are okay in all of this, potentially an insurance agent, so you can really work on driving down those insurance costs, and then a Vistage coach, a business coach, uh, um, someone who's gonna be there to help you with some of the emotional um, stuff that we're all going through. And I know for me, being a business owner all these years, it can feel a little lonely. Uh, and so it's really important that you've got this team together of people that are gonna help you go through this. So what does uh, disaster planning look like? Well, it depends on, on putting together a forecast that says, hey, if we're 25% up, great. If we're 25% down, what does that look like? What does our org chart really look like? And who are we gonna keep and who are we gonna cut? And then as we go to maybe 50% down or maybe even 75% down, what is that? The other thing that you've got to do is scenario planning. Um, we're going to post this, uh, this form on our website uh, on, uh, today at 5 p.m. But this is a 13-week cash flow forecast that we've developed. And what it'll allow you to do is week by week, make sure you know the ins and outs of what's coming in your business and manage cash to the penny. The other thing you really want to do is segment your customers. Really segment your customers for collection planning into A, AA, and AAA. A being, I know they're gonna pay, double A being, uh, it's a little iffy, triple A being, I'm really worried they're not gonna pay. Then you wanna go make sure you're reviewing contracts and where it's appropriate, um, maybe increase deposit levels so that you can really get your money in faster. That's that DSO, really get collections gone uh, a lot faster. Maybe think about lowering terms, putting personal guarantees into your contracts, late fees and interest, things that you never thought you could put into a contract before may be necessary in this new environment to make sure you get paid. Because if you don't get paid and you do work, that is the absolute worst thing that can happen to you. Make sure you have a strong stop work plan or stop delivery plan. Make sure you have strong relationships with the accounting departments inside of your customer. Make sure your accountants understand and know the personal lives of those people that they're dealing with on the other end of the phone, or in this case, a Zoom or a go to meeting call. Other thing on collections is make sure you get invoices out more quickly and accurately. If you're working with big companies, if they don't have all the T's crossed and the I's dotted, they just kick them back and it's gonna get tighter. So make sure your invoices are done correctly, but also if you can cut your invoicing time from five days after the close of the month to one day after the close of the month, in most cases, you're gonna improve your cash collection by anywhere from 15 to 20%. So that's a big, uh, a big improvement. Make sure you also think about taking alternative forms of payment, digital forms of payment, and then make sure you've got a good collections attorney. That was part of that business attorney crisis team who can help you uh, collect in case you've got to get to that, and that's that spot. On your supply chain, you really want to check um, and make sure that these businesses that you're working with are going to survive. That's a huge thing. You might not have had to underwrite them quite as significantly as you do now. The other thing is, is that this is an opportunity for you when you go into those conversations to renegotiate your terms with your suppliers um, for cost savings, because if you're in a position and I was just speaking with a client this morning, if you're in a position of balance sheet strength, who is a Vistage member? And, and we, I said, look, you came into this with balance sheet strength. Let's go get aggressive and, and, and really use our balance sheet to our advantage to get some cost savings. Next thing you wanna think about is inventory planning. Make sure you understand um, the, uh, the gross margins by product, understand what's flowing through. This is a report that we do for customers uh, that shows exactly what their sell through is. What are the different things that they've got in terms of inventory? This happens to be for a restaurant, uh, but you can do this in any business that's got inventory. You have to understand what your gross margin by product is and what your sales volume is so that you can project out what's coming and make sure that you understand not just the total inventory terms, but inventory terms by product so you can stock the right things uh, in this kind of environment. And again, really getting to performance goals, running your business by the numbers uh, is never been more important than it is today. Let's talk a little bit about a legal strategy. With your legal strategy, what I want you to think about is working with attorneys and your internal accountants to review all the contracts that you've got. There's nothing that, no, no stone needs to be left unturned in this particular case. And think about this concept that's, again, a traditional legal concept, rarely, rarely used, called force majeure. Force majeure says, essentially, to put it in today's terms, if the government forced us to shut down, what, is, what happens to the contract? 
And again, it was always just sort of a throw and I would review all these contracts and think, all right, well, that's part of the boilerplate language. Now it's actually coming into play. Very important thing to think about. You also wanna look at your contracts for termination rights and uh, termination risks. Are you on the hook? Do you have personal guarantees out there? Um, and what are your rights under the contract? Do you have renegotiation rights? Are there other provisions in the contract that need to be altered or renegotiated based on a change in the environment? That's the legal strategy. Now let's dive into some hoarding of cash. There's a bunch of different tactics I'm gonna throw out here to hoard cash that are all very important. First one, slow pay AP. You're getting slow paid, make sure you're slow paying AP. It doesn't mean you don't pay. It doesn't mean you don't you know, work uh, with the contracts you have or honor the contracts that you have, but make sure you're not quick paying without a discount. If you get a discount to quick pay, that if you have a strong balance sheet is probably the best thing you can do because now you're increasing your profitability. Long-term cash is gonna go up. Next thing is obviously collect your AR faster. We talked about that um, previously. Then you've got to really tightly manage inventory levels. Manage your daily utilization if you're in a service business. Instead of allowing your people to put their time in weekly, mandate that they put it in daily and manage to weekly accountability, sorry, daily accountability and daily utilization. This is a big change, but this is an opportunity to really start to upgrade your culture. Next, think about the stop payment. Where, if you're in that, that, that survival mode and you've got to either survive or, or pay somebody, you may have to stop paying. So really work with your attorney and your internal accountants to make sure you understand who you have to pay, who you don't have to pay. I'm gonna throw another very um, sort of controversial tactic here, but it's really important to think about. Uh, about four weeks, five weeks ago, Ford, Hewlett Packard, um, and Boeing all drew over $80 billion each on their lines of credit. Ford did this because they did the same thing in 2008. They took their money out and they put it in another bank. Why did they do that? Because now they have a full cash parachute in case they don't make any money. They've got a parachute that is not gonna be taken away. For most of us, our lines of credit can easily be pulled back. So think about whether or not this is a strategy you need to implement to keep your, your, your business safe. And again, I'm not saying not to pay the interest, not to keep up with the covenants inside of the loans. I'm just saying, take control of the cash today. Don't let the banks all of a sudden strip that cash out or lower your line of credit without you um, having control of it. The big thing that's going on also, obviously, as we're sheltering at home, and I'm at home here too today, um, is make sure you're having proactive landlord discussions. Really get out in front of this. Uh, we've got a, a handful of relationships with national uh, real estate firms that are, that are switching from leasing to really renegotiating leases and working on that. So make sure that you're thinking about what's the appropriate use of space because landlords are getting beat up all over the place. If you're proactive, if you're talking with them and working with them and showing them that you're, you're doing this in good faith, uh, you're likely to get a very good uh, deal out of this. And maybe now, because it used to be retail, maybe now you're just using it as office space, you can get a reduction in rent, something like that. So this is just things to think about. All right, let's talk about some cost cutting stuff. Um, so first of all, there is some moratorium on evictions going on at different states and different counties. Just take a look, because there's a really complicated set of rules that are both federal, state, and county rules that we need to be, uh, be, be mindful of. Some obvious cost cutting things are things like shutting off the air conditioning and the lights at your office space if you're not there. Um, changing the internet access or, or internet um, costs at your office if you're not there. These are some obvious things that, that sometimes are, are some of the last things that we think about. Go in and negotiate loans. I've heard great things about banks um, actually being proactive and helping people negotiate existing loans to either have um, moratoriums on payments or deferrals or suspension of payments for a little while. And right now, if you have an SBA loan, um, you actually have a six month moratorium on principal and interest payments if you had an existing one coming into this. Uh, that was part of the CARES Act. So things that you want to be obviously mindful of. Um, obviously always ask for discounts. This is never a bad thing uh, in this environment. It's mandatory and be proactive. If you're gonna go out and purchase because you have cash, ask for that discount for early pay so you can increase your profitability and ultimately increase long-term cash. Then look at little things, um, little fees here and there that are really kind of death by a thousand cuts. You've got credit card fees, lease and loan fees, bank fees, and then insurance costs. Um, some big items here are things like payroll. Focus on some things that you can do to cut payroll costs. Here's an example. You can shop payroll providers. There's outsourced payroll providers all over the place. Find the cheapest one. Make sure that you're competing with those. Next thing is think about how you're paying yourself as an owner. Are you paying yourself through a payroll salary 
when you can pay your suite, cut your salary down and pay yourself through distributions. Now, some of that's gonna be limited by some of the government programs we're gonna talk about, but that's a clear way that you could cut some payroll taxes out of the cost. Another little thing, but it adds up is office supplies. Look in our office, we're not there anymore. So the paper supplies went to zero in this month of April. We also used to stock the shelves filled with snacks for everybody. That cost is gonna go away. These are things that are some minor benefits, but benefits of coming into this situation. Then take a look at freight because freight costs are always negotiable. I talked about this before, but I really wanna hit on it again. If you're in a service business, I, in my firm, we require daily time entry and we tell people to put it in as they go. I don't want them to overbill. I don't want them to underbill. I want them to bill exactly the work that they're doing. The best way to get accuracy is to bill as you go. And we require it to be in every single day. We're checking on it and, and making sure that people are doing this. In this environment, this is a chance to increase accountability in your organization and actually increase the efficiency by daily monitoring of utilization and realization rates. Again, when you do this though, you're gonna find out that you're gonna increase accountability. Some people are literally going to just leave. That's okay. That means you can replace them with somebody who's going to be there and who wants that accountability. And generally people who like accountability are high performers. Next thing I want you to think about is outsourcing. As I told you at the outset, um, we generally save up to 40 to 60% of our clients' costs versus full-time hires. So if you really care about running your business by the numbers and you want accuracy, um, we're a good fit. We're much more expensive than bookkeepers, but those guys don't really get numbers accurate. If you need accurate numbers, you want to outsource to a firm like ours so that you can really cut those overhead costs and people costs. You also want to think about outsourcing your IT, outsource your HR, outsourcing your benefits administration. As I said, outsource payroll, all of these things that can save you some money. If you get to this point, you might have to do some layoffs. There are some really important rules that you want to make sure of, some HR rules and some notifications that you've got to give during this time because people are getting extra benefits for unemployment. Uh, which is uh, is kind of amazing. In a lot of cases, it's actually better to lay people off. They're actually going to make more than they would have made in salary because at least over the next uh, 20 some odd weeks here, uh, people can make an equivalent of a $55,000 salary on unemployment. So it's important to think about the personal interactions that you have because layoffs affect culture. So if you've got to lay people off, do it the right way, do it respectfully, and make sure that you um, you know that you personally are doing the right thing for the organization as a whole. So you're gonna set the right boundaries and say, hey, if we get to this spot, remember that disaster plan, if we get to this spot, this is where we've been in layoffs, and these are the people we're gonna cut. Furloughs are also an option here. Again, just decrease the workload without laying people off and you can cut costs that way. Another thing to think about is leases. Can you go back to some of your machine leases, your copier leases, um, things like that, and make sure that you've got new leases in place for the long haul that are maybe more cost effective. Uh, next thing is think about machine utilization. If you're in a manufacturing uh, facility capacity, are you running two, three shifts? Are you using all the space that you could? Think about different ways that you can reorg that, uh, that factory to make sure that it's, it's more efficient and more effective. We've got to talk a little bit about insurance when we talk about cost cutting, because if you have fewer employees, you're going to have less workers' compensation insurance, but you should also review your general liability and E&O insurance. What I'm finding is very few people um, are having any success getting any kind of business interruption insurance paid for. Now, I don't fully appreciate why, but what I can tell you is it's just not happening. Um, and the insurance experts that I've talked about say this isn't really what it's for. So business interruption insurance is really seemingly for natural disasters, and that's about it. And we could call this a natural disaster, but it's a government imposed one. And, and I'm hearing that insurers are just are absolutely not paying for this stuff. Next thing you want to think about here is, is going through the government programs. So we're going to talk about this, and this is a bit of a quagmire of stuff. So I'm going to weave through it, and then we're going to take some questions at the end. First thing that we had available to us was disaster loans. This is still available. Very important to be thinking about this because they're not mutually exclusive to the other things that are out there. The next thing is they gave us payroll tax, uh, tax credit and payroll tax deferral options. This is a wonderful idea in theory, but practically speaking, it's, it's ex if you do this, you exclude yourself from the PPP. So for 95% of the people out there, this is not a great option as compared to the PPP. So the other thing obviously that's there are some really interesting tax incentives. I'm gonna talk about the PPP in a second, but if you've got suspended losses, you can go back and refile your taxes for 2018 and 2019 and get refunds, that's cash. If you did TIs or building improvements, or other capital improvements to your space, 
that you had to wait to depreciate, you can now accelerate depreciation and refile old returns and get a refund. This is critical stuff that if, you've, uh, if you're in these situations, work with your CPA, again, part of that crisis team, and your internal accountants to make sure you're refiling so that you get that cash um, as quickly as you can. The next thing that's out there is um, some new benefits for employees, um, sole proprietors and independent contractors. So really think about helping others so that you can be helped. Understand the rules here because the unemployment benefits got significantly extended and enhanced. As I said, for some people, it's actually better to lay them off. It might be better for you and them to lay them off. And then as business comes back, you can look at rehiring later, but it might end up working out in everybody's favor. All right, the PPP. Should I still apply? The PPP officially not notified everyone that they ran out of money yesterday. Um, I thought the money was pretty much spoken for within the first four or five days, but they've processed, to the SBA's credit, they processed what they said was 14 years worth of loans in 14 days. So as hard as it's been and as tough as it's been, um, uh, they did a pretty decent job. Now, should you apply anyway? Yes, prep your application. We have an organizer, a PPP organizer on our website. What I have found is that the small and community banks are processing these things pretty quickly. The Bank of America, the Wells Fargo's of the world are having a little bit of a struggle with it, but I've known people that got uh, their applications through there too. Even if you haven't applied yet, you should still go and fill out an application and get in line. My estimation is, and Mnuchin said this, and Trump has said this, is that they're, gonna, they're going to um, put more money into this program and I think they need to put anywhere from three to five times the amount they originally put in so that they can get the loans to everybody. The next thing to know is that if you were approved you and you got a notification from the SBA that said you were approved, you will get your money. You're a part of that money that's already been accounted for that they say is already spent. So not to worry on that part. If, however, you weren't approved yet, you probably need to get approved in the next round of funding. So make sure you're ready and get in the front of the line as fast as you can for this next. Now, a lot of people have questions about forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Let's, the latest rules from the SBA, which came out, uh, let's see, two Thursdays ago, um, were very clear. And what they said is if you get, and I'm just gonna use the example of 100,000, if you get $100,000, $75,000 has to go to payroll. Payroll including wages, benefits, insurance, um, uh, uh, property, or sorry, payroll taxes at the state and local level, and any kind of severance commissions, et cetera, has to go. 75% of it has to go. So if you're getting a $100,000 loan, 75,000 has to go to that payroll bucket. There are still a lot of things that are unclear. Can you pay people more than $100,000 annualized? Can you, um, can you pay in, increased benefits? Could you make five payrolls in this period rather than four? All sorts of different things that we still have to get clarification from the SBA on. But what is clear is that you have to put 75% towards payroll. The 25% left is eligible for forgiveness if you use it for occupancy costs. So you've got to use it for occupancy costs. And if you do that, which is rent, uh, mortgage interest, utilities, things like that, then that is forgivable. Any portion of the 25% that you don't use on occupancy costs is the non-forgivable portion of the PPP loan. So that's how the forgiveness works with that. All right. Then the government confused us even further and gave us another loan option. And this one came out of the treasury. And what they said was, is we, we notice that there isn't nearly enough money in the budget on those PPP loans. We're gonna give new loans out to larger mid-sized businesses. And these are loans that start at a million and go up to 25 million. You have to have at least a quarter million dollars of EBITDA to qualify. And they're called Main Street Funding Loans. And what they are is they're, you, they can be used for anything, not just payroll and occupancy, you can use them for anything. And these are not, exclusive of the PPP. So if you've done the PPP, you should also do the Main Street loan if you qualify, because there are great rates uh, with this. It's a four-year loan. You get the first year interest uh, interest and um, principal free, and then you amortize at between two and three quarters percent and four percent. The government came in and backed banks on this. You don't go through the SBA on, SBA on this. They backed the banks on this one, and it's really neat because um, they're, they're, they're guaranteeing 95% of these loans for the banks, which means there's no personal guarantees. There's no personal underwriting for you to do. This is just go to the bank with your packet. And again, on our website, we have another um, uh, uh, loan package that you can use to gather the information and then let banks compete for your business on this one. Banks are making money on this. They're happy to help. Again, it's not with the SBA. So that's a really, um, a really nice thing. And again, you should definitely apply. Woo, all right. Let's talk about ways to thrive in this because 
I'm uh, again, I'm a business owner, entrepreneur. That's my background. And I just don't sit still very well. And so I don't really believe in kind of just sitting here and, and letting, you know, this economy punch me in the face. Uh, I want to kind of punch back. And so let's talk about some ways you can thrive in this. I'm going to give you seven tactics here that are really important uh, and write these down as we go through them, because we're going to show you some, I'm going to show you some offensive tactics and some defensive tactics that you can really use to thrive in this environment. Let's talk a little bit about defense first. So when you're thinking about a strong defense, what I want you to do is restructure your costs to a new norm. If you're working remote and it's working for you, maybe there's a lot of ways that you don't have to go back to the office environment in the, in, in the future. I can tell you for our business right now, um, we spend about 12%, no, about 12% of our revenue on occupancy costs every single month. We're gonna take that and shift this dramatically. If we're in this work from home environment for another month or two, and we're doing well with it, we can create a good culture, we're not gonna go back to the offices. We're gonna shave those costs, and I'm gonna allocate a bunch of that cost to improving culture, getting team building uh, uh, events going, getting ways that we can connect in better ways uh, to make overall our culture go up, but our costs go down. This is a time when we've got massive change to be able to restructure, uh, do a permanent restructure and really uh, change the cost structure in your business. The other thing that I wanna talk to you here is uh, is is a really unique part of the CARES Act. And this is where you can get creative. In the CARES Act, there's this little thing that was hidden in there about student loans. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to pay up to about five, a little over $5,000 per person. You can pay their student loans off and it's non-taxable to the employee and it's a deduction to the employer. So I'm just gonna use a round number. If you were paying somebody $55,000 a year, you could go to that, that employee and say, would you like me to pay off your student loan? I'll pay you 50,000 and I'll put 5,000 towards your student loan. It won't be taxable to you. Huge benefit to the employee and it's still deductible to me. And by the way, there's no payroll taxes on it. So these are the kinds of little things that you wanna think about that are in some of these um, uh, government programs that are not quite as, as well known. The other thing that you wanna think about when you're, when you're going on, on this is, is new IT costs. So IT security, obviously very important um, and, and outsourcing your IT could be a great cost savings. But what you wanna do is think about how can you use technology to actually make your business more efficient and more effective. This economy may be the catalyst that pushes you over to spend that little bit extra money on the front end that's gonna save you and, and get you a whole new cost structure on the back end. The next thing that I want you to do is think about employee benefits. Think about a new way of looking at employee benefits. The pendulum has really swung here, okay? We used to have a very low unemployment um, world where all of us were constantly thinking about how do we attract and retain and retain and retain. I think now we wanna think about employee benefits and how do we build the culture that we want? What is the accountability that we want? And I personally believe in things like uh, what I'll call defined benefit healthcare. So instead of just taking the increases in healthcare and paying a percentage of it, what if you said, I'm gonna pay $500 per employee. I'm going to pay $1,000 per family. I'm going to pay and set that as a fixed dollar amount so that as increases go up, your employees can pick what, what sort of health insurance coverage they want. But now your costs aren't going up in year two, year three, year four. You're letting your employees choose. You're defining the contribution, not defining the benefit. And you can think about that for things like your 401k. Set in, in accelerated or increased matches. Instead of just doing a 3% across the board profit sharing plan, Think about it in a different way. Maybe you can take that cost out and say, listen, I want a culture where you contribute to the 401k, I'll match. If you contribute up to 5,000, I'll match it with 1,000. If you contribute 10,000, I'll match it with 5,000. If you go all the way up to the max, maybe I'll match the whole thing. That way you're really incenting a accountability culture and getting people more in line with what you want your organization to look like long-term. So again, think about performance-based 401k as we're going through this. The next thing that I want you to really think about here is a strong defense with your staff. You need to think about cutting underperformers. This is not a time to hang on to underperformers. This is a time to move away from them because what I have found at least is that when I fire underperformers, people usually look at me and go, why didn't you do that sooner? This is a time to act decisively as leaders and take control and make sure that you're upgrading the talent on your team. Again, we've talked about this. I'm not gonna beat it up anymore. Make sure that you're outsourcing uh, to really cut costs and, and upgrade the talent level of, of the product that you're doing. The other thing to think about here on the strong defense is travel and entertainment costs. 
the whole economy has shifted. If your salespeople can now sell remotely via Zoom and WebEx and these kinds of uh, virtual meetings, we have a whole new per diem going on when it comes to meals and entertainment. And that is awesome for us business owners because that's been a little bit of a black hole in the past. Now we can increase accountability. Maybe we can shift some of those dollars to marketing that actually makes sense, that gets us in front of the right people. Maybe we can shift some of those marketing dollars into actually lowering our price and going and getting really aggressive with new customers and trying to beat the competitors on price. Think also about sales budgets and what you've got to spend and make sure that you're getting and holding people accountable. Oftentimes, we kind of let people go with sales. I think this is a time to measure everything that's going on in sales every day. And I'm not saying micromanage your salespeople because really good ones hate to be micromanaged. They want to be given a goal and then they want to go hit it. But think about changing the commission structures so that when they hit it, maybe they get really accelerated commissions, but you're lowering it for your lower performers. So you're lowering overall comp for poor performers and significantly increasing comp for high performers. Think about your process. When you're re-engineering, this is a time to go in and re-engineer process to gain efficiency and accountability. Look at every single one that you've got. What I want you to think about, I'll just use accounting is, is, is a really easy example. Build a cookbook style process with circles and arrows and everything you can think of that is just down to checklists so that anybody can do this stuff. That's gonna increase efficiency, increase accuracy. It's gonna decrease your cost because what happens oftentimes in our businesses is I, I, it's, like a, it's like a physics problem. You know, work just expands to fill the space we give it. So if you give something 20 hours, magically it gets done in 20 hours. And if you say, oh, you can get it done in 30 hours, well, it's like a gas, right? It just expands to fit the space we give it. When you really go in and hone in on your processes and you dive into those, what you'll find is you're clamping down on that, increasing accountability, and high performers love it because high performers love to be efficient and effective. And low performers hate it because they can't hide anymore. So this is an opportunity to upgrade talent, upgrade culture through process, make them real, you know, really, really tight processing. Uh, same thing in your warehouse uh, and with purchasing processes. Same thing again um, when it comes to uh, any of your management processes, because maybe those management meetings that you had are not important. But in our office, one thing that we're doing is we're doing a mandatory 7.30 a.m. wake up call with me, with the CEO. And everybody is on Zoom and their cameras have to be on because we're all in this together. And I didn't make this stuff up. I learned this from Ernest Shackleton's book, Endurance, or the book about Ernest Shackleton, Endurance. What got those people through survival in the Antarctic was process and routine and a sense of purpose. And I didn't want this work from home to turn into Netflix and chill. I wanted it to be, get up, we're going, and we're all in this together. So we get up at 7.30 in the morning and we do like a five minute yoga or a five minute breathing thing. And we have announcements that come out and everybody is on it and it, you can look at each other and go, okay, all right, we're all in this. And I think that's really important. So really think about that as you're, um, as you're putting together your management processes. And all right, let's talk about going on the offensive. Defense is fine, but I'm an offensive guy. Um, well, that sounded weird, but hopefully not that funny. Anyway, uh, <laughs> now I'm just laughing at myself. Uh, when you go on the offensive Matt, here, what I want Matt, you to I don't think, think you're offensive. Matt, I don't think you're offensive at all. You're, you're a good looking uh, guy. You're going to roll. <laughs> Keep going, man. Don't worry about it. I'll tell you what's offensive is I can't get a haircut. <laughs> My hair is like going crazy. Uh, you're, so, just, you're just bragging because you got hair. But go ahead. Now, go ahead. You're, you can play some <laughs> offense for us. Go ahead. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so, look, when we're going on the offensive here, I've talked about accountability a lot. But, but like I said, that unemployment pendulum has really swung uh, and, and, and we need to, to not take advantage of it in the way that we're taking advantage of employees, but take advantage of it to treat people fairly, but also res demand respect and demand to be treated fairly. The proper, in any relationship, a proper relationship is a mature relationship of equals. It's not where one is on top or taking advantage of the other. That always feels horrible in any relationship. Don't let that relationship happen at your, um, at your firm. What I want you to think about here is, do you have the, facility, the capabilities to go and start to take top talent away from your competitors? Can you actually go in and lose your bottom performers and start to take top talent away from, top, uh, from your competitors? You guys all probably know who the top talent is in your industry, in your area, in your local uh, region. Get out there and start being aggressive. Let's go hire people away from other people that are gonna build that long-term business. 
because winners win all the time in down markets in up markets in every market winners win you want more winners on your team really tighten down objection uh, obje accountability metrics and objective metrics don't manage by hey i think you're doing a good job manage by outcome every single person knows their job and is managing to an outcome there's a great netflix documentary out right now um, on nick saban and bill belichick and the, the theme, it's just a conversation between these two of the most winning, uh, winningest coaches of all time. And these guys sit there and talk about know your job and do your job. It sounds super easy, but you got to know your job on an objective basis. And then you got to be held accountable for doing your job. These are really important to get your job descriptions done by objective, not by subjective metrics. Then again, upgrade your culture. This work remote thing is not a chance to just slack off. This is a chance to increase accountability and increase communication points. In our firm, we've had some leaders really step up and start to do things like a midday push up and lunge challenge that everybody can get on a Zoom and in the middle of the day do that. We've had people step up with social, social gatherings. Our teams are setting up virtual happy hours. These are all opportunities uh, that, are, that are created out of working remote. Think about creating structure and stability. Really require a buy-in from everybody. Don't let anybody be a negative Nancy, right? Don't let them just sit there and complain about all this stuff. Those are the people you want out of your organization. You want positivity. And really create opportunities for promotion based on performance. Change the dynamic. Go on the offensive. Say, we're not going to shelter in place like, you know, our, with our business. We're going to get out there and we're going to let our winners go out and, and succeed and really, uh, really get out there and pay your starters. Focus on your starters, focus on your top players and pay them. Really make sure that they know they're top players and they're gonna deliver results to you that are gonna allow you to pay them. All right, let's talk about some more offense. So um, more, connects, more points of connection outside of the office. Like I told you, these are our folks. This is my TGG guys. They look like a bunch of accountants. Um, and this is our daily push up and lunch challenge. And these guys have so much fun with this stuff. And we never would have done this if we were working in an office. Instead, working from home, we've got this connection point, this new um, virtual workout program thing. And these guys are fired up and we're having fun with it. So enjoy it. The other thing you wanna do when you're going on the offensive is automation. Automate and innovate. Invest in technology that's gonna be and, and be better and better for your processes. Make sure that you're less dependent on people and upgrade every chance you get to, to really get more and more efficient. Think about your other uh, your pricing. What I want you to do is really go and negotiate hard with vendors. Get uh, get better pricing, get better deals for maybe even early payment terms because these guys are going to be freaking out. Don't be the one freaking out. Be the one that's going and being aggressive, being positive, being confident, and go and negotiate these terms so that you can get better overall profitability because that leads to longer term cash. Make sure that you think about bigger margins. Do you have different products? Can you can you align your product a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right so that you end up um, getting better margins out of it for the existing uh, environment that we're in now? And then negotiate everything. Get in there and really be aggressive with trying to negotiate on everything that you can. Uh, last but not uh, least here uh, is I want you to really go and beef up on sales. Track activity, pay your winners and cut your losers. Make sure that you can go out and if you've got a strong balance sheet, start to undercut your competitors. Go out and beat them on price because if you can get longer term contracts, longer term relationships and you're the survivor, you can get that price increase in, in later years. Right now, you can, though, you can start taking market share from some of your competitors. So really get out there, hire away that top talent, make sure that you're giving, you're the one that's got better job security, more upside potential without letting bound, downside performers drag you down and really understand the customer lifetime value. If you're gonna do this, you've gotta stretch that customer lifetime value. It can't be about today, it's gotta be about a long-term sort of strategy. And in this sales, think about doing, this isn't gonna work for everybody, but think about putting in sort of a sliding pay scale, where if your customers pay you early, they get a discount. If they pay you in 30, no discount, 10% premium, maybe even a 20% premium, as long as you get paid, if you get a premium for, for financing essentially your customers, as long as you guarantee you're gonna get paid, which was some of the contract terms we talked about before, you're gonna increase your profit dramatically. If you get a 10% increase, for most people, that's a 100% increase in profitability. So be flexible and aggressive in some of this stuff. And differentiate your product with like, you know, free looks and free terms for three free months in, uh, like maybe three free months in exchange for slightly higher prices and longer term contracts. If you're selling a product, maybe it's 
sell, give one away to sell the other one, the old HP strategy. You know, we give away the printer, but we sell ink at a ridiculously high price. And then find new methods of pricing that really fit the changing landscape. Um, never give up on long-term gross margins, but in the short run, think about what you can do to really impact uh, and start to take market share away from your competitors. All right, that's uh, that ends my part of this. I really want to thank uh, Joe and the whole Visage crew, and I also want to thank my entire team who have done a tremendous job with all the research on all the different government programs that have come out and really helped me put this thing together uh, and get you guys the information so that you can have some tactical things to really make a difference. Uh, again, um, we're here to help as much as we can. You've got our contact information here. And I think uh, if I'm remembering right, we're gonna open it up to some, um, some Q&A at this point. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Boy, take a deep breath. Uh, you just rattled off about uh, 42 minutes of just pure gold. Um, I'm sure people have taken tons of notes, uh, lots of ideas, and we've just had a lot of questions come in both before and after, and we've kind of curated them into some broader categories so you can kind of keep your, uh, your mind focused on this. And the first area is around the Payroll Protection Program, PPP, and it's around maximizing forgiveness. Now, you, you talk through for those people that maybe have not applied and they're on the outside looking in to go ahead and do that. You said that, that while there's not money now, there will be more money. We feel confident about that. So get yourself ready, get yourself in line, and that money will flow. We're also hearing that money is starting to flow, which means people's thoughts are now shifting from, okay, I got in line quick, I got the money, now what are the rules, and more importantly, how do I play this game? Um, so under the topic of maximizing forgiveness, just some questions that came down. Um, after submitting our application for PPP loan to a bank, we received a reference number. Will we also receive a loan number once it's being processed, or is that their only communication? So what are those steps for people that are filling out? What are the communications you hear back from, uh, from an SBA bank? Well, so typically when you submit your loan, you're going to get a loan number from the bank. Then they'll get you an SBA number that is the number that, when, that shows that they've actually put it in and applied for it with the SBA. Um, when you get an approval, you'll actually have to sign the SBA approval form, and that shows that you've been approved by the SBA. Uh, and then once you've been approved by the SBA, then you're in the queue to get paid and it takes anywhere from two to five business days to get paid. Um, we actually received our funds on uh, Wednesday night uh, at TPG and our clients have received about 25 million of funds so far and we've got about 80 million um, that should be expected to come in in the next day or two. Yeah, it's really amazing how the SBA and their, and their partner banks were able to pivot on this. And we've heard some amazing stories in our members uh, about how they were able to to work their way through and get to the and get to the right place to get in line to get that money. So and it is starting to flow. So let's dig into okay. So I'm in queue uh, or I've gotten my money and now the the clock's ticking, right? So PPP questions. Do you have to use the funds by June first? No. What you have to do is use the funds over the eight week period starting which you got the money. So, so the, us, clock starts, the clock starts when the bank, when it's deposited in my account, click. That, that's correct. And, and what we've done at TGG is at 5 p.m. today, um, we'll release a calculator that is a forgiveness calculator that you can download off of our website that's a, a modified Excel spreadsheet that will, you'll be able to put the, the money that you've got in there and put the potential expenses and you'll be able to see exactly what that forgiveness is going to look like. Okay. Well, everyone is obviously the attraction here was the eight weeks of forgiveness and what that looks like. So that's one of the one of the draws. Yeah. Uh, another question: Can the PPP loan be used for transportation costs? Does that include like pay a car lease? Would that come under the occupancy category versus a head county uh, category? It, it's a great question because in the original bill, the CARES Act, um, there is this nebulous term transportation <laughs> that goes under occupancy costs, right. and yet the SBA has not defined what that means. So I am anticipating we're going to get some clarity in that in the next couple of weeks from the SBA. Um, okay. And, and so right now, uh, could you do that in theory? I just, there's not a lot of specificity around that yet. So you're suggesting there will be a day of accountability or a day of atonement on this if you get a little more creative than maybe what they might realize as being legit. Absolutely. Look, I mean, we all just use the reasonableness test. If you go, for example, on the payroll part of it, 75% has to be used for payroll. If you go on the you know seventh week and the sixth day of eligibility, you pay yourself a quarter million dollar bonus. That right. probably not gonna work. Yeah, probably. Okay. <laughs> uh, here's another one. We have bills owed for inventory for our retail store. Can we use PPP funds to pay for our merchandise owed? 
No is the short answer, but, but think more broadly than that because that's not the real answer. When money goes into your bank account, it's like putting a drop of water into a pool. You can't take the drop back out. So make sure that you're accounting for your PPP money separately. That's what this tracker is intended to do. But really, you have money now. So <laughs> there's another pool of money to go out and and right. and pay for the inventory. But but technically, no, the PPP money can't be used to, to yeah. pay for inventory. Yeah. The eight weeks of salary just it comes from they cover that and you use that what would have been that salary to go cover your cost. Understood. You right. got it. Right. Can you use the PPP program towards state and federal payroll taxes? Uh, state, not federal. State, state not federal. taxes are, yes, absolutely. Federal, no. Is that by state or all states? Uh, it's all states because this was a federal rule. Okay. Can 100% of the PPP be forgivable if you use 100% of your, 100 of your PPP loan for payroll and you meet the FTE and 75% payroll rules? Yes. So I can, apply, I can apply 100% of it? Minimum of 75%, but no maximum. Right. Um, interesting, you, you brought up the student loan program and that hasn't really come up, but it's, it's really an interesting way to leverage this program. Is that student loan payment included as part of payroll? So it falls under the PPP? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, okay. I would, so uh, benefits are uh, definitely obvious, benefits are included. And so I would, I would tend to interpret this to be another employee benefit. Um, okay. Uh, that would be covered under that, but we haven't got. That's not clear from the from the loan or from the bill. So I'm I wouldn't say that definitively. But um, what we're taking the position of is that we're going to get some clarity on this right, right. now, reasonable, and try to right. interpret it in, the, in in the most honest way possible. And then and then as we get clarity, we'll we'll adjust. Okay. Okay. Well, let's 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 move forward then. Um, we got the full PPP to cover eight weeks of payroll, rent, utilities, and receive 5K from the EIDL advance. Can we still get the full EIDL, the traditional SBA program? And if so, can we use what can we use the EIDL for? We want to make sure the PPP gets free of it. So you've got these multiple programs, and then you mentioned the mainstream program. Is there like a massive Venn diagram where they all connect? Do they function independently? How do you how do you play that? I mean, it's, don't hate the player, hate the game. I know, but there are multiple games being played here. Sure. Um, so there are really three things that you want to, three financial things, take the tax side out of it, right? The, the refiling your returns and getting refunds. There's the disaster loans, the PPP and the main street loans. Those are the three things. What, um, what the PPP said is if you had a disaster loan already, you had to use, uh, you, you had to use the PPP to refinance the disaster loan. Okay. It's silent on what we don't know is if you get the PPP first, can you then go get the disaster loan second? I would suggest. Right now, the answer is yes. So, but the disaster loan you can only get if you can't get credit anywhere else, right? And it's right. really, uh, it's it's up to two million bucks, and you can use it for anything. So that's kind of cool. Uh, but then you've got the Main Street loans, which I would say bracket it. So if you if you can't get credit anywhere else, and you got the PPP for the disaster, loan, if you can get credit and you have a a good business in general, or you had a good business in 2019 that had at least 250 thousand of EBITDA then you can apply for this Main Street loan program. So I would say the cornerstone is the PPP. Everybody should be doing that. And then choose either the disaster loan or the Main Street loan to pile on top of it. Okay, so we found 84% of our members uh, were going to or were planning to apply for the PPP, unless their numbers in the EIDL and the other programs. But your suggestion is make the core PPP and then see how EIDL or Main Street can complement that to meet your cash flow needs. Yes, because the PPP, assuming you do it correctly, is 100% forgivable. That's free money. The other yeah. two are all loans that need to get paid back. Right. Well, and that, well, yeah, obviously. And that leads to the next question, which is, uh, do what we can within the rules to maximize forgiveness. Is it cash basis or accrual? Should you hold off paying vendors now and wait until funded to pay them from a separate account? That's kind of a winding question. Uh, but yeah. it comes from the rules about people. We want to figure out how do you maximize this forgiveness? What can you say so, with that? Yeah, um, I, I, the, the, the law is totally silent on this issue right now. So we're expecting to get some clarity on it. What I would tell you is, is that in general, our theory is that they're gonna interpret it the same way you interpret your taxes. So if you file your taxes on a cash basis, you can do this on a cash basis. If you file your taxes on an accrual, you're probably limited okay. to, to the eight weeks doing it on an accrual basis. Okay. But this um, is pure speculation. Okay, and last one under the PPP category. Uh, talk about employee retention. 
what are the PPP rules? 25% of what? Headcount, total payroll. You know, and you had mentioned with from an employee standpoint, in some cases, I'm better off being on, on uh, unemployment because I'm making more than I was making in whatever job I had. So can you talk about, um, about employee retention? Uh, and a second aspect to that would be, what if I have already laid people off? There's a provision that if I bring them back by a certain date, can you talk to those three scenarios a little bit more? Yeah, so there were, I think, three things in what you've said. And the first one is Sorry. the bill had um, limitations on either reduction in wages or reduction in headcount. The updated interim guidance on that took that out and said, you just have to spend 75% on payroll. We're not going to try to measure whether or not you've reduced force or not. So that's all out the window. Okay. You don't have to bring people back. You just have to spend 75% of the money on quote unquote payroll, right. which is wages, benefits, et cetera. Um, I expect we're going to get some guidance. There's some confusion as to whether or not you can pay people if they make an uh, annualized salary greater than $100,000. Does that qualify towards the 75%? Again, I expect we're going to get some some clarity on that issue here shortly. Um, okay. The other part of your question was really around um, around layoffs and, and how do we do this part of it? And what I would tell you is if you don't use that 75% on payroll, you have to give it back. So don't hire people just to pay them for eight weeks and then fire them again. That really makes no sense because there's a lot of other expenses that are administrative that are not part of that 75% that you're gonna to have to incur just to bring them back on payroll and take them off. So make a best, the best business decision possible for your ultimate um, profit or for the, to maximize profit in your organization. Don't just bring people back to qualify for the 75% under the PPP. Okay. All right, well, let's shift then. Uh, we covered a lot of ground on this. Let's, talk, let's dig into some of the survive topics that you talk about. Uh, you brought up the force majeure. How do you work around that? I mean, like you said, it's kind of a throwaway clause. Everyone just kind of glanced over, but you said it's coming into play. How do you work around that? Well, it's, it's work with it. It comes into play, depending on, on what contracts it's in, it can come into play either to help you or hurt you. Um, because what it essentially says is that if the government shuts us down, um, then the contract is essentially suspended. Now, in many contracts, it's two-sided, meaning the contract is suspended for both sides. However, in a number of contracts, it's unilateral, meaning it's only one side that gets their obligation suspended, not the other. So it really, you have to go contract by contract, but this clause, which again, nobody ever looked at really, yeah. <laughs> doesn't really pay attention to, is now you know under, under pretty serious focus. Okay, great. Uh, next question. This comes back to you made a point about if you have a line of credit, go to that bank and get that money and put that money in another bank. So the, 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 your line of credit bank can't just shut you down. So here's the question. Drawing 100% on line of credit wouldn't stop the bank from calling the loan. Okay. Which are banks more likely to do? Calling loans or reducing line of credit availability? So there's, a, there's an assumption in there that I don't think is entirely accurate, which is that the banks have the right to call the loan. The banks don't have a right to call the loan except under the terms of the of the loan agreement itself, which there might be some covenants that if you break a covenant by doing this, yes, they have the right to call it. Or if you're not paying interest, okay, they have a right to call it. Or if it's up for renewal. But the, the, the challenge is, is that banks do have the right under their contract to lower your line of credit limit. Most of them do. And so if you have a, a, a million dollar line of credit, you've only drawn a half a million, they could call you and take the, your whole available balance to a half a million tomorrow even if you're fully in compliance with all of the terms and covenants in, inside of the loan. So what I'm suggesting is, assuming that you're still in compliance, take the full million out. That way you have now a new $500,000 parachute, but still comply with all the covenants of the loan so that the bank can't foreclose on the loan or call the loan. And then should the crisis pass, you just move it back and you're all taken care of. It, it's, yes, it, and it's like, you know, most people's lines of credit are somewhere between three and a half and 5%, call it 4%. It's a 4% that you're paying for an insurance policy that you've got more cash set aside in case you need it. Okay. And it's taken away from you. Because if you're just depending on your line of credit, in 2008, I watched this happen, where lines of credit literally got swept without even telling the customers. They just went and said, we're, we're taking it down to the limit you've got, and that's it. And in some cases, they swept their checking account to pay off the line of credit and close it on. Okay. So I'm anticipating the banks are gonna end up doing something like that or at least even if they don't, at least you have the cash. Okay, okay. Um, you mentioned cut down on office space. Uh, what are some suggestions with locked into a lease to reduce costs? You talked a lot about, about renegotiating uh, your leases, yeah. but uh, talk some more about that, please. Yeah, so um, 
uh, we worked with a restaurant chain that's got uh, eight or nine locations and, and really worked with them to talk to their landlords. And what's happening if you could put yourself in a landlord's shoes for just a second oh, yeah. is just straight up not paying them and saying, nope. And, and, and in this one center, uh, all the tenants got together to bind together and say, we're not paying. You imagine if you're the landlord and you owe the bank money, like yeah. <laughs> how are you gonna feel? Yeah. So what I'm suggesting is be proactive in your lease negotiations. Call them and say, look, it's not that I don't want to pay something or that I don't want to help you out, but you got to understand the situation I'm in too. And so in order for me to be able to pay you, I have to stay profitable. So how do I stay profitable? How do we work together to get through this so that you don't lose the building to the bank, but I can't pay what I've been paying? And so it's just a matter of opening up the kimono a little bit and having an, an honest dialogue with the landlords that that ultimately should should um end up in a better overall situation for everybody okay great thank you uh let's shift because i want to get a, a couple questions in under the thrive category um and you know you had mentioned that, that there are a lot of companies in distress but some are really surging some are doing well and this this question comes from one of those our e-commerce business for personal care items is booming we're having the reverse issue of fast growing pains um how do you prepare for the crash when amazon comes back it really the question really is how long is this going to last you know, I call it we're in the pause or the great wait. How long is this going to last until the gears of the economy begin to recycle? And I realize you're not an economist, you're an accountant, but that's a question on everybody's mind. Yeah. Um, uh, this is all pure again. I, I First of all, I don't know what I'm talking about. So let's say that. <laughs> I, would, I would dispute that, but go ahead. Um, but I, I think we're going to see, uh, I, I think this is going to last between um, anywhere from two to three years. Uh, maybe as many as five, and the hangover from this is is going to last longer than that, probably as many as ten years. the The real issue is how do you plan in either a growth mode or a contraction mode in the new economy? And I think the key, if if they're selling a lot of personal products like hand sanitizers and masks and things like that, which one of my clients is, um, is is you ought to be careful because you can't just all of a sudden stock up, go get more warehouse space, all the rest of this stuff, and think that masks are going to be on sale, you know, like this, and the demand's going to be there for like the next five years really want to supply uh, and and demand plan that moving forward but i think we're economically we're we're in this for a long time yeah it feels like uh this will be GDP, a... jp morgan chase put out a report over the weekend that they are sorry during the week i think it was on wednesday they speculate the gdp is going to go down 40 percent four zero wow. four wow. that i don't even no one alive knows what that looks like you know, it's very clear that at some point when we get to the other side of this and begin some type of reboot and recovery, that there will be a before coronavirus world and conversation and a post conversation. Whatever you did or were or were not in the pre-world doesn't matter because we're going to have this massive business reset. And this is where you are today. This is your revenues, your customers, your employees, and we'll build or not build from that point in time. And I think what people are trying to understand, well, when is the gears of the economy going to start going? And you know, my point has been that we're at a level of business activity today uh, based on the current level of quarantine. Unless or until that changes, business activity won't change. Now, you're hearing May 15th, you're hearing June 10th. I don't know what that day is when we begin to move from only essential services, but to now necessary services. Um, but in the meantime, we're in the we're in the pause. We're just waiting for it to wait out. Listen, Matt, you have been amazing today. I want to thank you for your insights and all the points you made about all the things we have to do to survive and to thrive and the great actions and activities. I know that many people will be replaying this and going back and taking notes uh, for all that you did. So thank you very much for that. Um, and thanks, everyone, for, for spending time with us today and, and listening into the great insight from Matt. Uh, we'll be sending the recording to everyone in, in just about 24 hours from now. Uh, so look to get that recording. And if you're a Vistage member, you can watch recordings on demand from our Leading and Challenging Times series. The latest editions as a best-selling author, Jim Collins, did some amazing custom modules for us that are really powerful and really thought-provoking. And of course, we had Patrick Lincioni last week and just an amazing session with him. And these are the types of events that are gonna be, the types of speakers and the types of topics we're gonna be bringing to our Leading and Challenging Time series. Go to vistage.com slash coronavirus. That's vistage.com slash coronavirus. That'll take you to our Coronavirus Resource Center. Um, and that's where you'll find all this content. So again, Matt, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, invite everyone to go and download that, uh, that PPP uh, calculator. I think that'll be a valuable tool and we'll look forward to hearing from you again. So stay safe, everyone. And thank you again, Matt. Thank you.